Anthony's always a tough act to follow because he never really tells you what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony are, and I, I like to think are good friends. Anthony and I spent some time together on the Accounting Standards Board. We've known each other for a long time now. It has been it's a long time. scary. You, you're getting a little... Great? Yeah. Yeah. It helps, yeah. With, it helps with the teaching. More people listen. I, know. I have a really good hairdresser who fixes that for me. So anyway. Even nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. I always find it when I come to these conferences, Lynn, I love it because all the, the students are in the back there and, and you all look so young and you make me feel so old. But then anyway, there we go. Okay. And you, one day you too will be doing this and, and feeling that way. I can guarantee you that. So I want to talk to you today, just to make sure I know how this works, that's perfect. Uh, I want to talk to you today about an uh, interesting endeavor that the Accounting Standards Board, thanks Sorry. for your credit cards, okay, um, has, is doing with regard to what we might call a non-traditional activity for an accounting standard setter. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And I honestly, uh, truly, there is a lot of what uh, Anthony said that really resonates with the discussions that we've been having at the Accounting Standards Board. But the one seed I want to plant before I go any further is please understand that what we're doing is not about just non-GAAP. We, we are talking about an issue that goes beyond non-GAAP. And so try to keep that in mind, even though the way we got started into this was about uh, non-GAAP. So hopefully that'll come out as I continue uh, to talk. Um, and the other thing I want you to understand is our objective in this, we don't have an end game in sight. Our objective is to raise awareness and start a conversation and then be an active part of that conversation to see where it goes. So taking off of what Anthony said, he was talking about, you know, uh, the Bloomberg and the non-GAAP adjusted earnings. <coughs> For a moment, I want to use an example that, uh, that I've been using for some time. This is a, 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 about Fiat Chrysler. And in the automotive industry, there is a report, you know, every month the automaker will go out and say, this month we sold this many vehicles. So understand that that is not uh, a number that is governed by an accounting standard. It was, it's the number of vehicles. Fiat Chrysler announces back in January of 2016 that they have been reporting the number of vehicles inaccurately. And look what happened. So the point of this slide is actually quite simple. Uh, information that is outside the realm of the financial statements is used on a regular basis by folks who are making investment decisions. Often that information is not governed by any accounting standard and it's not audited and it matters, it makes a difference because if you look at that curve, there were people who lost money as a result of that announcement. Now fast forward over a period of time, by July, there's an announcement of an SEC investigation. So the regulator did step in and ultimately what happened is they not only learned that they were announcing the units wrong, but they had a problem with revenue recognition in their financial statements. So, um, over the course of several months, a big event um, for uh, Fiat Chrysler. Here's another example, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but Twitter. Twitter overestimated the number of its subscribers. And we've heard about that in terms of other, other companies as well. Um, in this particular case, even though they overestimated, it didn't have the same type of effect on their shares because they just continued to fly. But the point was, there was information out there that wasn't accurate and again, it's not covered by any accounting uh, standards, it's not audited, but the number of sub subscribers, like the number of units, is indicative of what the future of that company's growth trajectory is going to be. And so um, analysts pay attention to those numbers and they make decisions, and the key element there is that type of information matters. So, our journey. And it's lovely that you've already been here and you've talked about some of the information in your report because I always, I always start out, how did we get on this journey? And I always start out with talking about your report, Anthony, mm -hmm. uh, back in the fall of 2016. And that report issue, or when it was issued, garnered a lot of attention. And at the time, I got a phone call from the Globe and Mail um, and they were gonna write an article about that report. Uh, and it was called, I think it was called the numbers game. Yep. 
And um, I was quoted in the article, Cameron McGinnis from the Ontario Securities Commission was reported uh, in that thing. And, it, it, and, and Anthony's really covered off some of the things that it, it talked about, but it talked about the significant rise of non-GAAP. And it talked about how people use that information and about how in, in almost all cases, and I think it was something like 85 or 90 percent of the time, I'm yeah. looking to you to shake your head so that I'm in the True. right ballpark. Okay, good. Do I get an A on that? You do. Okay. okay. But it's kind of one of those intuitive things, right? They, yeah. Ninety percent of the time, they serve to inflate the number. That's right. right. So that it, 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 you, you rarely see a non-gap measure where it's worse than the r related <laughs> gap measure. It's it's almost always better. So flash, you know, this is back in 2016, and we had a, a fair bit of dialogue about the attention this was garnering, including talking to our own user advisory council, which Anthony used to chair. Uh, about this topic. Go forward now to February of 2017, and I was asked, as I, I say that nicely, I was asked, I was actually pushed uh, by one of the members of my oversight council to be on a panel that was meeting with very senior buy side and sell side analysts in February 2017. It was actually sponsored, uh, jointly sponsored by the CFA and CPAB, the Canadian Public Accountability Board. Were you at that? T were you in those so. sessions? Yep. I think you were, yeah. And uh, we had two sessions. One session was buy side, <coughs> the other session was sell side. Uh, these were very senior analysts, so, so keep this in mind. These were analysts. Heads of research. Head, yeah, exactly, heads of research. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, see, he's very helpful, okay? Um, <laughs> They were people who were very senior, and if you looked at the market, the, the value of the portfolios that they were, you know, overseeing, it would, it would have been equivalent to the market cap in Canada. These are not junior people. And as well, when we went around the room and asked them about their background, more than half of them started their careers be, by becoming a designated accountant and working at a firm, getting their CA at the time. So these are very... Uh, well-educated, very sophisticated people. We had these panels and we started talking to them about the, the, the thing, the, the, the original topic of the panel was the relevance of the audit. That was the, the mindset of the discussion. We very quickly got into the discussion around the information they use and whether or not the financial statements, because they were audited, played a, a different kind of role than this other information. So the way we talked about it, we said, here's the financial statements in the notes. They're audited. There's the MDNA, which is governed by the securities regulators. Now, they knew that the auditors looked at the MDNA, but they could not articulate whether or not it was audited. They kind of sensed there was something different, but the requirement actually is the auditors read the MDNA to make sure it's not inconsistent with the financial statements, okay? But the, these people couldn't articulate that, but they knew there was some kind of difference. And then you move quickly on to all the rest of this information they use, which they said was 85 to 90 percent of the, the total sum of information they use. So in other words, they said, I've got the audited financial statements, the MDNA, everything else, what I call the wild, wild west, okay? And that everything else they very quickly kind of forgot that there was no assurance and they didn't really, they couldn't articulate whether or not they understood what kind of quality was embedded in that other information. So when I would ask them, do you ask management when you're talking to them about any oversight they have? Do they have their, their finance department look at this other information? Do they have their disclosure committee look at this on other information? Do they have their audit <coughs> committee? Do they have controls over it? They could not articulate you know, any, any information in that regard. They had no level of awareness of the quality of that information in terms of, but yet they were ascribing 85 to 90 percent of their investment decision over this other information. And it would include things like uh, presentations, <coughs> website information, regulatory filings, you know, information that is out in the public domain uh, and they're using it, but they couldn't articulate, you know, any, any awareness of the quality of that information. So if you, again, if you take anything away from what I'm talking about, our goal is to improve the quality of all of that information. So it goes beyond non-GAAP. So uh, moving forward after those discussions, <coughs> 
The Accounting Standards Board had a strategy session in November of 2017, and we had been discussing this issue uh, throughout this period of time. And at the end of that strategy session, uh, where we looked at some of the key activities that uh, 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 corporate directors are also thinking about, and some work that one of the firms had done with regard to this in their work with uh, senior directors, we all kind of looked at each other and said, well, we think somebody needs to raise the awareness about this lack of potential lack of quality in this 85 to 90 percent of the information that investors are using. Somebody needs to start that conversation. But we all knew that it wasn't the traditional role of an accounting standard setter. But we all felt that because of the skill sets that we had as a board, um, some, we have some preparers, uh, I myself come from a preparer background. I used to be the chief accountant of Royal ba Bank. Before that, I was in high tech as a, a senior accountant. Uh, I have people from the audit firms on the, the board as volunteer members. Uh, I have an academic. I have a user. Uh, I, we, we have a broad range of backgrounds as volunteer members on the Accounting Standards Board. And we said, you know, if not us, who? We'll start this conversation. And we were fortunate that we received uh, support from our oversight council in terms of venturing off into what is non-traditional territory for an accounting standard setter. And so with that, we decided to take action. And in June of this, this year, we issued a draft document that is called a uh, framework for reporting performance measures. So again, it started with non-GAAP, but it goes uh, clearly beyond non-GAAP. And the other thing that we did in this document, to be clear, while everybody feels most comfortable talking about these, this type of issue with regard to public companies, we also firmly believed that this, this type of issue exists both for private enterprises and non-for-profits. So non-for-profits, they get grants uh, from big granting agencies and they get information, uh, they provide information to those granting agencies around that what, what does it cost me to do this particular activity in my organization and what impact am I having on society by doing this activity? And they have measures uh, that support those activities. So that's their equivalent of what you call non-GAAP. Same thing happens for private <coughs> enterprise when they not only um, have a lender who can usually get more information if it's a traditional bank lender, but private equity investors in, non, in private companies get additional information from private enterprises. So uh, what, what we are clearly doing, as I said, goes beyond non-GAAP and also goes beyond public companies. And so the framework, if you get a chance to read it, it's not an onerous read. Um, it is a document that is meant for all types of reporting entities and, and not just public entities. This is some of what it talks about. It talks about uh, I'm gonna, I want to talk just for a second about transparency, consistency, and comparability because I think those are important. When we talk about transparency in the framework, we're talking about telling people what the measure is, why they use it, why it's relevant, and how they compute it. So giving transparency to the, to, to the measure itself. When we talk about consistency, we talk about using the same computation period over period over period. Analysts like trend information and users like trend information. Are the costs going up? Is the revenue going up? What's happening? Um, and so if you change the way you compute something or provide information, you need to tell people that you're giving that information to, that you know are relying it for some type of investment decision. <coughs> um, you need to tell them that you've changed it, why you've changed it, have you changed the comparatives, etc. When we talk about comparability, that's where it gets a little harder because in terms of these types of measures, every industry has their own types of measures. They're different. And I like to use the, the, the example of banking because that's where I came from most recently. There is a metric in banking that's really important that all the analysts follow. It's called net interest margin, okay? Five big banks in Canada, five different computations of net interest margin. I happen to know that because I spent a few years of my life trying to negotiate with the other, with my peers in the other big banks. Let's, could we all get on the same, same method of computing net interest margin? That hairdresser I talked about who takes care of my gray hair, yeah, does a good job of covering the gray hairs I got from those conversations. 
uh, they are mind-numbing conversations. Comparability <coughs> is harder. I know that that's what people want, Anthony. Mm -hmm. They want that number to be computed exactly the same way by, the, by everybody in the in industry. That's harder. That's why transparency and consistency are so important. Because at <coughs> least the entity can say, I'm doing it this way, here's why I'm doing it this way, and I'm doing it that way period to period. The other thing I just want to highlight is what users told us is that they would like to know which measures trigger or are related to management compensation. So in other words, if in the banking industry, return on equity is a big measure. And return on equity was kind of a hurdle rate to get into the bonus pools. So that's an important measure from a uh, compensation perspective. They wanted transparency on that. And when we talk about the expectation gap, it's that gap about the quality of information. So we know that the financial statements are audited. We know that, that there's some quality oversight over the MDNA. But what is the quality and oversight over the rest of that information? And that's where we found that there was a gap in terms of understanding, that there was an automatic expectation that there was the same level of quality built into that other information. But what we've learned from talking to people that that's just not the case and we're trying to give some awareness to that. So we agree 100% that it takes everybody in, involved in this process, and here we, they're all listed, to help improve this information. And that, um, uh, that it can't be done by us. And so we've launched this document, as I said, to raise some awareness, to um, get people involved in this process, uh, and to kind of move this forward in a way that the quality will become much better, and then if the quality is better, then that's, that enhances the relevance of the information that people are getting to make either investment, donation, lending decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the ACSB is well positioned to start this conversation because we have a lot of advisory committees, we have a lot of educational outlets. We can bring people together to have these conversations. And so since June, when we first put this out, uh, that's what we've been doing from an outreach perspective. <coughs> this is what the document looks like. Um, it's, Rebecca, how many pages is it? <coughs> Roughly. 15? <coughs> okay. It's, an, it's a fairly, and it's big print, by the way. Big print. <laughs> some of it, not all of it, but some of it's big print. With graphics, okay? With graphics. Uh, so it's not hard to read uh, in terms of that. Uh, we, we did look at other pieces of literature that already existed. So um, in the past, uh, CPA Canada would have put out other guidance. We leveraged that. Uh, we looked at some other publications. We talked to a bunch of people who are knowledgeable in this space. We talked to you, Anthony on a regular basis, imagine. right? We did, imagine that. Um, and so we tried to get others involved that ultimately led us um, to this document. And as well, uh, this document has been shared in London. We presented it at the table in London at the ISB's Accounting Standards Advisory Forum. And we've also presented it down in Norwalk to the FASB and to some other standard setters. Uh, and that you'll see in the document that we try to align ourselves with basic concepts that do exist in the standard setting world like neutrality, you know, free from bias, uh, faithful depiction of a number, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, th that's, the, um, that's the basis. Um, we talk about this, we try to talk about how our framework works relative to gap measures, non-gap measures, other financial measures, etc. cetera. Um, we think, it is our opinion, uh, that this, this framework is a principles-based document that is meant to be complementary to other guidance, including what the CSA does in terms of their domain over non-GAAP. We're going to continue the dialogue about making sure that's where we stay with this document. Um, we talk about things like how do you select a relevant performance measure? Um, and how do, you, um, how do you decide which ones you want to do? These are just graphics that exist within the framework. Here's another one where we talk about the pillars. One of the, user, one of the analysts in that uh, session said he thought of the, the financial statements like the foundation of a house. So you, you have a strong foundation for the information, um, in, and, but then the other stuff, the other information is like whether you have three bathrooms or four bathrooms or whatever, it's the other stuff. 
And I said, yeah, but you know, the financial statements, are, if they're the foundation, it's kind of buried in the basement. So that analogy works both ways. But we have several pillars. We talk about cost benefit. We talk about controls and procedures over the information, which would be similar to something like SOX, where you looked at internal controls over financial reporting. Why wouldn't you have similar controls and procedures over this other information? And also potentially looking at your governance practices. And when it comes to cost benefit, we talk about they should be relevant to the size of the operation. So if you're a smaller operation, you're going to have relatively less governance than you would if you're a larger operation. With all of that, we put the draft framework out in June. And if you think about the typical standard setting cycle, we decided to do this in November and we put a draft out in June. Um, my staff um, is still recovering from that, um, but we did it. And uh, for us, that's about lightning speed. And we're very proud of that because we said this, 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 this concept, this concern about this other information and whether it has quality or not, is so important, we need to get the conversation as soon as we can. We are, we are taking comments on the framework. We're doing outreach. Uh, we've, uh, we've extended the comment period till October the 1st so that um, people could have time with the CSA draft rule out, have time to look at both our framework and the draft rule to give them time to do that. Uh, where are we headed next? We don't know. What we know is we've started the conversation we wanted to start. It's garnering a lot, of inf a lot of interest, including internationally. We have, internet, we have other standard setters from other jurisdictions who are looking at the document and potentially thinking that it would be useful in their jurisdictions. And so we think that this is putting Canada on the map. Strong leadership role, which is apt because even though we're 3%, we're a pretty strong 3%. We have a very strong financial reporting environment, and I myself am always proud to represent Canada at those international meetings. So with that, we've, um, we look forward to any questions, but this is where we are, and uh, we'll keep you posted on next steps. And here is, by the way, the contact information. Rebecca, raise your hand. This is Rebecca Villeman. She is director of the Accounting Standards Board staff. She's here today in case you want to chat with her over one of the breaks or lunch. She is the senior person on this project and uh, has done uh, the writing and the heavy lifting, and so we look forward to having uh, further conversations with you today.